three, we're going to try to cover the childhood and the baptism of Jesus today. Back to what we're doing here. A gentleman named Michael Rood, what he did is he took the feeding of the 5,000, which is the only event that appeared in all four Gospels, and he used that to synchronize the Gospels. And so instead of reading all of Matthew, all of Mark, all of Luke, all of John, we're reading a story that happened in Matthew, may have happened in Mark, happened in Luke, and we're reading it that way. With, with a key focus on a couple of things. Matthew's Gospel, Matthew was a Jew. His Gospel was written in Hebrew, and he actually set out to prove that Yeshua was the Messiah, son of David, that we had talked about when we went over the two Messiahs. Mark, who wrote later, many people think Mark wrote like the memoirs of Peter. Mark was a Greek. He wrote about the Messiah, the suffering servant, or the Messiah, son of Joseph. Uh, Luke spent a lot of time, and Luke wrote his version of the gospel much later, but his is very accurate, very detailed. He was a Greek doctor, and he went back and did all the history and all the facts, and he shows our, our Savior as a son of, son of man, and then there was John. John wrote, the original version of John was written in Hebrew. John was a disciple whom Jesus loved. And John wrote of Jesus as the Son of God. Then John also wrote the fifth gospel, or the Revelation, where he writes about the return of Jesus as the Almighty Judge. So we're going to try to focus in our study on those aspects of Jesus as we get the painting of the full picture. The other thing that's very important, and, and this is something that gets very overlooked when you don't read what's left of Matthew. Everything Jesus did, he did on a Sabbath, on a feast day, or in reaction to a man-made rule that he was showing was, was non-existent and we should not be following. So we're going to spend a special focus on plugging in what he was doing on what particular feast of the Lord, because as we're taught, he was a Torah-observant Jew, he followed the feast of the Lord. So we're going to keep our focus on the feast of the Lord and whenever possible point out, and some of the most amazing miracles he did were on these seven appointed times that God said his people were to follow forever. Uh, even so much that God put the sun, moon, and stars in the sky in the book of Genesis to show his Moedim or his appointed times. So we're still going to focus on those appointed times. So we left off last week while we we're talking about the, the birth of Yeshua and the word being made flesh. Um, so now he is, they're going up to Jerusalem uh, to, to take part in uh, the redemption in the temple. So this was found in the Torah and also... Mary being purified uh, with the poor man's offering, also found in the Torah. So these people were walking, they were talking, and they were doing things uh, as, as per the Torah um, and following the instructions of Yahweh. So just a quick background about purification in the Torah. It says uh, in Leviticus 12 is where you can find this. It, talk, it says, Then she shall remain in the blood of her purification for 33 days. She shall not touch any consecrated thing nor enter the sanctuary until the days of her purification are completed. Continuing, it says... Uh, and when the days of her, her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb, a year old for a burnt offering, and a, and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering, and he, sh and he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. Then she shall be clean from her flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child, either male or female. If she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. Okay, a lot of times we don't understand what that clean and unclean means. It doesn't mean she was a leper, you couldn't talk to her, she had to be put out of your house, anything like that. She just couldn't go into the temple and perform religious rites and, and, until she was considered clean. And this is the one rite that makes her clean again. Now, for if you gave birth to a son, the son had to be circumcised on the eighth day, so after that, it would be, uh, what, 33 days, so it'd be 41 days, then she could go back into the temple and make this offering. Uh, for a daughter, it was actually 66 days, and many people believe this is tied to the fact that there's blood involved in original sin and that all descendants of Adam had sin in them. I don't know the exact reason for that, but it was 41 days if you had a male child and 66 days if you had a female child before you could go into the temple for religious rites. I've always found it interesting that Scripture says life is in the blood. It's important to note here that they made a poor, the poor man's offering, meaning that they weren't very wealthy. So in Luke 2, we read uh, in verse 22, it says, And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of Yahweh, the Torah. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to Yahweh. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of Yahweh, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this, was, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. 
So again, if you don't know that the poor man's offering is the two doves, you wouldn't understand. This is telling us a little about the socioeconomic status of Joseph and Mary. They're not very wealthy. They had to make the poor man's offering. So moving on in Luke 2, it says, And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen uh, the Lord Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought brought in the child Jesus to do him according to the custom of the law, he took him upon the arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, your Yeshua, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And that's huge because this guy got it. This guy knew that Jesus was coming to restore people to covenant with God or Israel to covenant with God, bringing the Gentiles back into Israel, so to speak, as we covered in the last couple weeks. So moving on, uh, uh, we're going to go to Psalm 98. It says, The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So this is the reference that, that Simeon was making when, when he was quoting the, the Old Testament in the, in the last passage. So uh, it says, The Lord has made known his Yeshua. Um, so that's, you know, I, I always love to insert uh, the name of the name of our Messiah into the Old Testament readings, especially in the Psalms over and over again, when it just it keeps telling us that that Yeshua is is our salvation, that that the, the Messiah has become our salvation. And they knew about it. The Old Testament writers knew about it. The, the Israelites knew about it as they were walking. As they knew uh, the revelation that was that was coming uh, in, in a future time. So moving on to Luke 2. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Miriam his mother, Behold, the child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel for a sign that is opposed. And then in parentheses they add, And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phenuel from the tribe of Asher. Important here. Anytime someone was not from the tribe of Judah, they pretty much tell us what tribe they were from. Paul says he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Anna was from the tribe of Asher. But very few people were from these other tribes. Almost everybody was a Jew or from the tribe of Judah at this point. So she is from the tribe of Asher. She was advancing in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then a widow until she was 84. So we don't know when she got married, but seven years after she was married, her husband dies, and she's 84 years old, waiting to see this baby. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to Yahweh and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So what's amazing to me is that these people knew their scripture. They knew the Torah, they knew the Tanakh, and they knew that the redemption of Israel was coming through the Messiah. So, uh, you know, we oftentimes see the the negative side of it where the Pharisees had become so wrapped up in their own man-made traditions and their own man-made ways that they missed the Messiah because they were focused on the letter of the law and obtaining their salvation, they thought, was by the works that they were doing. Well, there were still people, there was still a remnant, much like there is today, that was holding on to the truth and holding on to the true meaning of the word, and they were able to see the Messiah for who he was. All right, these next couple slides I just realized I kind of put out of order. In May of 2 BC, Jupiter was coming in conjunction with the king star, or Melek. It then comes in conjunction with Venus in June, and now the wise men are watching this the whole time. And Jupiter comes in a mass conjunction with Mercury, Venus, and Mars around August 27th. So we're about a month from when the Messiah is born. These signs in the sky are starting to come up. And what you have is in the constellation Virgo, you have this bright light coming through her to between her feet. So that's what the sky looked like at the time. And the wise men, of course, knew all this. So by September, when he's born in late September, that light has passed through there. And that's when the wise men realize that's the sign of the king being born. They watched it for years. So we touched on it light, lightly last week, but during the time of the Babylonian captivity, Daniel was taken in, um, and he trained the astronomers how to see the how to see the sky, how to see the stars. So they were looking for this sign from the very beginning. So when Gabriel came and revealed himself to Daniel, Gabriel told him of the sign that was to come. So Daniel did not have any offspring of his own, so he taught and trained these astronomers like they were his own kids. And when he, when, he, when he died, he left them all his inheritance. So when we see the wise men come, 
they not only know the sign, but they come bearing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we're going to get to the wise men in a minute, but it, it wasn't just three. It was a whole caravan. It was a whole mass of people coming from Babylon to see the king and to give him the treasure of, of Daniel. And we're going to see what, what they're able to do with that treasure in a little bit. Because as we just read, uh, Mary and Joseph were very poor. They had to do the, the turtle dove offering, uh, the two turtle doves. So they couldn't afford to even give a lamb, which shows how poor they really were. Meaning that when they go to escape into Egypt, the money had to come from somewhere. All right, so moving on to Luke 2. Uh, it says, Now after Yeshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes, the people he inquired, of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, For so is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I may too come and worship him. So they knew about this star from somewhere. The shepherds had the revelation from the angels, but uh, the astronomers had to have known about it from some other time. So we see the reference to this in 1 Samuel 16. It says, Yahweh said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. So, so David, being the son of Jesse, uh, from Bethlehem is, is the reference to the Messiah ben David. So it's, it's the prophetic significance of being from Bethlehem, the king. David's always refer, referred to as the king of Israel, but the true king who will rule forever is, is the Messiah ben David, which is, which is Yeshua. And as we said in the Hebraic line of thinking, these prophecies are cyclical. So yes, that prophecy was fulfilled when David the Bethlehemite became king of, of Judah, and it was also fulfilled then when Jesus was born in Bethlehem to be the king of Judah, only on a larger scale the second time, obviously, because he's king of the world. But all of these prophecies are cyclical. So we see again uh, another reference to this. In Micah 5 it says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrath, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. That's the quote that the astronomer or that the that the, uh, the scribes were, were telling Herod. But the coolest thing about this is the one who's coming is coming from old, from the ancient of days. That takes all the way back to chapter 3 of Genesis in the garden mm -hmm. when God told Adam that one would come who would do this. That's, that, that's the ruler who's going to come from the ancient of days. So, so when, when Herod asked this, the, the, t the teachers and the scribes, you know, where's the Messiah supposed to come from? This is the scripture they went back to from Micah. And so we see in Matthew 2, it says, After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose and went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Okay, we put this in here just as a placeholder so we could discuss the wise men. We were always taught there were three wise men. They showed up Christmas night when Jesus was born. These guys came months later. They probably came sometime in late December. So the child was at least three to four months old by the time they got, probably three months old by the time they got there. We base the fact there were three on the fact they had gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and the Catholic Church even gave them names. Uh, so if you, any of the songs about the three wise men or anything else where their names are mentioned, that was derived by the Catholic Church about 300 years later. But three men would never travel alone through the treacherous area from Babylon or Ur of Chaldees all the way up to Jerusalem, especially with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. More than likely, it was a caravan of them that came from that area. Uh, and, and we have no idea how many there were. I highly doubt there were three, and we don't know there were three. The only basis of three is that there were three gifts. Uh, gold is obviously the gift for a king. Frankincense uh, is an incense, and burning of it represents prayer. It's used by the priests, and it indicates the priestly nature of the Messiah. And myrrh is a fragrant perfume used in embalming bodies. Inclusion of this gift can be seen as a prophetic of his death. 
So the three gifts together underline the fact that he was a priest, a prophet, a king, and that he was going to die for the people. And this was probably something that Daniel had left them in a writing, that when you see this star, when the king comes, take this wealth to them. Because Daniel was second in charge under three different kings in Babylon. Very, very wealthy man. And if he had no heirs, he produced these schools of astronomy and these schools of, of teaching, and he was a very learned man. So then these men would have studied this for 500 years, waiting for this sign, and then bringing the gifts of Daniel. So if all things work for the glory of God, Daniel being carried off into Babylon and being made a eunuch comes back around because then uh, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus get these gifts from these men. Do you have a question, too? Yeah. So if, if Mary and Joseph get these, like the gift of myrrh, and mm -hmm. knowing what it means, what it represents, like aren't they like kind of like, what, why are you giving us this? You know what I mean? I don't know. That's a good no, question. Like, it, it was valuable. Yeah. We, we know it was valuable beyond that. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, if they even fully understood that this baby was going to die for the world. Mm -hmm. But that is what it represents, and it was a very valuable gift. They may have just sold it. They may have used it in other applications. I'm not sure. Well, the angel told her. The angel told her that it was going to be the baby that was going to save the world. Plus, when Herod was killing them, at least they had some money to scoop. That's, and that's the key there. We know they had the poor man's gift. We know they didn't have the money for a travel to Egypt. Now they had money to travel to Egypt. Gold alone could have got them to Egypt, probably. And so we find that out in verse 13 when it says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what Yahweh had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. So again, we have this reference of the cyclical prophecies over and over again. Clearly, uh, you know, one of the applications of out, out of Egypt I called my son is the Exodus. And when the people came out of, out of Egypt, but it was a reference to one day that the Messiah would also come out of Egypt. So in Hosea 11, we see that when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. So again, uh, what I just said, a direct reference to Israel, but an underlining theme of of the Son of God, the Son of Man, the one who would come to save the world. So continuing, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem, and in all that region, who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then, he, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. So Jeremiah talking about the, the weeping of Rachel. So Rachel wasn't the mother of Judah, of the line of, of Judah. So what's interesting is that the reference to this is the surrounding nations that we talked about in our Lost Sheep series, the northern tribes that were dispersed out of Judah, that were separated from the kingdom, Herod went into all these towns knowing that they were also Hebrews, Israelites, and also slaughtered all of these children, knowing that he could have been hidden among these towns as well. So the reference to Rachel weeping is not directed just to the Jews, but to all the Israelites that were dispersed through the surrounding nations that were also massacred at this time. Yeah, Rachel wasn't the mother of the Jews. She was the mother of Joseph, therefore the grandmother of Ephraim, and these are the Ephraimites, or the scattered tribes. So we threw in that verse from Jeremiah. It says, Thus says Yahweh, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation, and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted for her children, because they are no more. So again, a reference to them being no more. The reference at the time of Jeremiah, the Ephraim was being scattered. So that is the reference to them being no more. But it's, again, a two-part prophecy because it's Ephraim being no more that the babies are being killed at this time. So Matthew, when he's, when he's talking in the gospel, he, know, he understands this, this two-part prophecy. He understands that Jeremiah was talking about what was going on at that time, but how also it's apply, he's applying it to what is going on in, in the current situation uh, with, with the Messiah and Herod and, and the murder of the innocents of, of two and under. Okay, interesting side note about Herod. Um, Herod was such a horrible guy. The people hated him. And as I said before, he was a descendant of Esau. He was an Edomite that the Jews put over Israel. And the Jews hated him because he was an Edomite. He was not a Jew. He was a cousin of their uncle, or a child of their uncle Esau, so to speak. But he was not a Jew. They couldn't stand the man. The Romans appointed him because he did what the Romans wanted. 
So the story from Josephus is that Herod knew everybody hated him, and he wanted, he was dying. He had these open sores, he smelled, nobody could stand him, and he wanted his death to be remembered. So he gave the orders to his men that when he died, they were to round up all the wealthy men in Jerusalem and slaughter them so that everybody in Jerusalem would be crying and weeping so that his death would be remembered forever. And people would cry. Uh, there was a story where someone said to him, when you die, people are going to rejoice. And he was said, no, when I die, people are going to cry. And he ensured that people would cry because he wanted everybody killed at his death. That was in all the important men, all the politicians, all the priests to be killed so that the whole town would be weeping and his death would be remembered forever as a day of mourning. So as the story goes, he dies. And the wise men, his, his, his advisors go to his son, who's now the king, and they say, look, don't do this. This will cause a rebellion. So his son does not do it. Then somehow, miraculously, Herod revives, finds out that his son didn't fall through with his orders, so he has his son publicly and painfully executed for not killing all the people when he supposedly died. So now, his next son is going to be king when he eventually does die. So we're going to pick up the story now in Matthew again with the story of Joseph getting a visitation from an angel that we just read, but this is Matthew's version of it. It says, But when Herod died, behold, an angel of Yahweh appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he arose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. So that, he, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. And if you remember back to, to the first part of this series, uh, we talked about how when he says by the prophet, the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. The prophets never said that he would be from Nazareth. Uh, there's, no, there's no verse in the entire Old Testament that said he will be from Nazareth or he will be a Nazarene. Uh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that's used in the Old Testament is Netzer. And Semach. And so the, what the Netzer and the Semach are, they are branches that shoot forth from the, the tribe of, of David, from the lineage of David. And we read uh, verse after verse about the Semachs from the Old Testament. There was a Semach that said the Messiah will be the king. There was a Semach, a branch that said the Messiah will be um, the son of God. There was a Semach that said he will be a, a servant and one that said that he would rule as a, as a judge. So when it's talking about that he will be called a Nazarene, it is a Netzer from the tribe uh, of David, or coming from the lineage of David, um, not necessarily the town of Nazareth. The next slide is just something a lot of people don't understand, but I wanted you guys to understand the political climate of this time. There was a huge revolt in 1 BC. Shortly after this, when Herod dies, his son Archelaus, after his funeral, which the funerals were seven days long, has 3,000 Pharisees slaughtered because he doesn't want any opposition to himself, and he wants all the people that understand the religious leaders to be slaughtered. So he has 3,000 Pharisees slaughtered, and he cancels Passover. The worst thing, he, now being an Edomite or, a Jew, or, or from Esau, he doesn't understand how important Passover is. Passover is a feast of the Lord. Passover is something they're commanded to keep. This starts a huge rebellion. So the Romans call him to Rome to find out what he did to cause this rebellion, and they send General Varius to Jerusalem, and 2,000 men are crucified. So we're talking maybe 26 years or 27 years before Yeshua is crucified, 2,000 men in Jerusalem were crucified over this revolt. So if you think of the people seeing him on the cross and what was going through their mind, that would have been a traumatic thing that everybody would have known. Kind of like, where were you the day Kennedy, Kennedy died, if any of you were around for that? Or where were you when the planes hit the towers? Where were you when 3,000 3, Pharisees died, a war broke out, and then 2,000 men went to the crosses? And, and, and Josephus says that they were just lined up waiting for somebody to die so they could get on the cross or be put on the cross. So you're standing there waiting in line for somebody to suffocate and die this horrific death because you're next. So then Luke throws in this line just to give us a time reference. Uh, in, in verse 40, we read, And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him, or the grace of God was upon him. So Luke continues in, in uh, the next verse. It says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year for the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, 
but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And again, I love the reference always of, of three days. And so we see that in, in the death, burial, and the resurrection. But, you know, the significance of the number three we see throughout uh, Scripture. Yeah, he disappears on Passover, and then his family finds him three days later. And again, there were three of the seven feasts of the Lord you were required to go to Jerusalem. Passover, Shavuot, which we call Pentecost in the Greek, and Sukkot, or Tabernacles, were the three feasts that you were required to go. So they would have journeyed to Jerusalem three times a year, every year as was, as was required. Well, then was this a premonition of his death? He disappears on Passover for three days. <laughs> and the interesting thing is is the caravan that they were traveling in. And again, like Darren alluded to with, with the wise men, they traveled in, in large groups because oftentimes it was days' journeys, weeks' journeys, where they would have to camp out. So why the wise men were probably in a, in a caravan is because that's how they traveled back then, and, and the Scripture gives, gives support to that. Uh, so Luke continues in his story. It says, And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have, you, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And I love this, how he answers them. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. So anybody that tells you he didn't know who he was till the Holy Spirit descended upon him at the baptism, that verse blows it out of the water. Yeah. He knew who he was. So when he says, again in John, I only say the things that my father says and I only do the things that my father does, he knew that from the beginning. He was about his father's business uh, from, from the very beginning. Um, and, and I also love, too, that he was submissive to his parents because you shall honor your father and your mother, and that was part of the Torah. And he knew, and he was the perfect rendition of the Torah. So, uh, and, and again, Luke throws in a time reference for us, and it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor or grace, again, this word is, is grace, with God and man. An important point here, you know, Matthew goes out of his way to show all these prophecies being fulfilled. Matthew goes out of his way to tie Yeshua back to the Torah, to show that Yeshua is all through the Old Testament. Luke's just a Greek guy on a mission to prove that this is the Messiah, but Luke also knew that he grew in favor with, with God and man. It was almost like the Holy Spirit just totally inspired that verse because it doesn't fit in with Luke's gospel, which is very narrative. It's very factual. It's very detailed. If Luke said it, this must have been a fact. How would Luke have known this if the Holy Spirit hadn't revealed it to Luke? And the interesting part is we haven't gotten into Mark yet. So we're about, we're about to enter into Mark, but the reason we haven't, there's there's no genealogy for servants. And so Matthew, who's, who's talking about the king, shows how the kingly line comes through Mary from the lineage of David through Solomon. So in Luke, where it talks about the son of man, it shows the lineage. Well, Mark is is talking about the servant. There's no background. There's no genealogy for, for a servant, which is why we haven't we haven't got there yet. And John hasn't written anything yet. Well the word became flesh well, is yeah. about about as far as as far as we got. So Johanan ben Zechariah, John the Baptist, uh, a time reference now is is after we see him at age twelve in the temple. The next we hear is uh, when he's going to be baptized. So John the Baptist is making the way. He's calling uh, for the mikvah or the baptism of repentance on the banks of the Jordan. And again, we talked about this in in our series on baptisms. But what a what a baptism was, a mikvah was at this time. It wasn't what we see today in the church at the time of of the Messiah in, in the Old Testament, people were being baptized or mikvahed all the time. It was when, when you were repenting of something, when you were physically unclean, uh, spiritually you felt unclean, it was a way of going in, sub submersing yourself underwater, declaring your sins, and coming out new. It wasn't going to somebody, yeah. having them dunk you. Uh, it was it was a, your way of confessing, your way of going under. And it was always a flowing stream. It was always in a river of some sort where the water rushed by and it carried your sins away. Yeah, so as we talked about in baptism, more than likely John was standing on a hill or an outcropping of rock, preaching repent for the kingdom is near, preaching a, 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 a word of repentance, and people were walking in themselves, confessing their sins as they walked in, going underwater, coming back up and coming out clean on the other side. It wasn't that, hold your nose and I'll dunk you back and pull you out like we know baptism to be. 
Picking up in Matthew, it says, In those days, John the Baptist, or Johann and the Immerser, came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So that reference at the end there is, is to Isaiah 40. And in Isaiah 40, we hear, uh, A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yahweh. Make straight in the desert a highway for our Elohim. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall, shall see it together. For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. So what I've always found so interesting is that John was, he was talking about repentance. It was a call to a change of lifestyle. It was a call to admitting what you were doing was wrong. It was a true change. It was a true call to repentance. And, and you know, often, too often we think that at the cross that changed and we don't have to live this, this true repentant lifestyle anymore. But that's what preparing the way for the Lord is. It's, it's repenting and allowing him to come prepare the way into your heart. And the call to righteousness is that once we are saved and, and those sins are washed away, how do we continue to walk in righteousness? How do we be obedient to the word of God? And, and that's where the falling away has been, in, in, in my opinion, is that we don't understand that once we have been made clean, how do we stay clean? How do we continue to walk blamelessly? Uh, because cause the Bible, and especially in Revelation, talks about the bride being one who is without spot, without blame, without wrinkle, without blemish. Who has the testimony of the Lamb and has kept His commands. So when He washes us of our sin, how do we continue to walk in that? How do we continue to walk in righteousness? You stay in the Word. You repent daily. Right. And the more you learn, the more you're subject to. And you walk in His ways. Good, Great point, John. I always like this next verse. Um, this guy had to be really strange. But crowds were coming to him. So whatever kind of crazy madman persona he had, his message had to be super powerful because this guy's standing there by the Jordan River preaching and hundreds of people are coming every day to be baptized by him. So he must have had an incredible power of the Holy Spirit on him and been an incredible orator to get these people to come. Because Matthew says, John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Locusts are technically clean by biblical standards. I wouldn't eat them, but... And Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were, were going out to him. So all these people are coming to him to be baptized in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, much like his younger cousin, he called them brood of vipers all the time, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, Elohim is able to raise these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree, and every tree therefore that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's prophetic, because we'll find out later Yeshua says the exact same thing in a couple of different messages yeah. that he preaches. And what's amazing to me is that, that John is referring to what we talked about in, in The Lost Sheep series so he's he's saying that it's about spiritual israel so they knew about spiritual israel they knew about the idea of coming into covenant spiritually with god before the cross they knew about it from the beginning that you didn't have to be a blood descendant of abraham to call yourself an israelite to call yourself someone who was in covenant with god it was more than just being that descendant it was about about taking the step about making the change yourself about being a hebrew which means to cross over to cross over from pagan ways to the ways of the truth and that's what being an Israelite is. And he's referring to that here when he says, it doesn't matter if Abraham's your, your blood father your, from your lineage, because if God wants to, he'll, he'll make the stones the descendants of Abraham. Any question? Yeah. Um, when Zechariah got killed. Yeah. Okay. And then he fled into the wilderness. That's what I was, yeah, I wasn't bringing it up, but go ahead. John, you can tell it. Okay. Well, no, I, I'm <laughs> just saying. I don't know if this I'm is thinking, tradition. I'm it's. thinking, where did he get all this? Yeah. Get it from the Holy Spirit. It said he was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. But right. you know the, the tradition story, and again, the, the scripture does not back this up, but the traditional story is that Zechariah told Elizabeth, take the child and go hide in the wilderness. And it does say John comes out of the wilderness. When Herod's soldiers come by to kill everybody, they say to Zechariah, 
where is the child? And, his, and he says he's at home with his mother. Well, then the guards come back and they slay Zechariah for lying to them. So Elizabeth is out in the wilderness with this child. Some people say she was raised by this group called the Essenes, Essenes who, who lived out there in the wilderness, and they baptized and did mikvahs continuously, and that might be where he learned about the mikvah. But a lot of people say he was raised by the Essenes. However, it does fit with the story, if you want to believe it, and again, it's not scripture, don't hold me to it, that he must have come out of the wilderness for some reason, and if he was six months older than Yeshua, and all the babies two years and under were being killed, it would be pretty odd to have anybody his age still alive at the time of Yeshua's ministry. His disciples would have been way younger than him, a couple years younger than him, or a couple years older than him, but John was right at his age. He was his contemporary. He was only six months' age difference. So, again, I don't know how true that story is, but it would make sense that John comes out of the wilderness and he's a little bit off. And it does say Zechariah was killed between the altar and the scripture. We're gonna, yeah, we're going to get to that when Jesus talks about that, but that's a cyclical prophecy also because Jesus does say to the Pharisees, when you slew Zechariah between the altars, and there's a story in, I want to say it's uh, Samuel, which we'll cover at a later date, where Zechariah, there's a Zechariah who's slain in the temple. So we don't know if Jesus was referring to the attitude of that or to the actual event. I think it's interesting, too, that John the Baptist was teaching outside the temple in mm -hmm. the wilderness, and the people came to him yeah. to learn about repentance. But who taught in the temple? Mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah. Yeshua. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but John was preparing them but before they could go in. He prepared way. them before they go into the temple yeah. of your heart. Another another prophetic yeah. symbolism. Yes, Tom. Was there yeah. a significance of yeah. the wilderness? Because as you were studying in the Torah, how to celebrate the festival in the wilderness, they wanted to. Was there significant, any significance of that? I think there's a prophetic significance, just that much as the Israelites had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years before they were allowed to, to enter into the promised land, you know, John is wandering in the wilderness, we're seeing, before he comes and makes straight the, the way of the Lord and, and teaches about repentance at, at the Jordan. So, yeah, I, I think there could be a, a prophetic... Yeah, that's, because that's to Dom's point. point, John couldn't have come and started preaching this message until Jesus was ready. Because then the message might have burned out after two years of hearing this guy baptizing everybody in town and the Messiah doesn't come. So there was timing why he had to be in the wilderness they, to come out. In, 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 the, in the Torah portion, Moses asked Pharaoh if they go in the wilderness to celebrate Sukkot. How about John? Was he celebrating? Well, John would have celebrated all the feast days if he was Torah observant, and we have no reason to believe he wasn't. Yeah, but he as was. As far as the prophetic aspect, he, uh, John also came in the spirit of Elijah. Yeah. I think Elijah was known for being in the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. So, continuing in Matthew, uh, so remember, John is talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, at this time, and, and anybody else who's listening on, on, the, on the hills of the Jordan, it says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Ruach Kodesh, or the Holy Spirit, and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. So one thing to highlight and underline here, if you're reading along, is... He's baptizing with the spirit and fire. It's not saying that, that the fire is the spirit burning inside of you, which we hear yeah, a lot those today. Flames over your head. But the spirit and fire are two separate things. To be baptized with the spirit is, is wonderful. It's a great thing. But when we're referring to the winnowing fork in his hand, clearing at the, the threshing floor, we see that the wheat is put into the barn, but the chaff is burnt up. Right. So to be baptized with fire might not necessarily be a, a great thing especially if, if we don't have the salvation of the Messiah, we're going to be burnt up like the chaff, uh, where we might all come under fire at some point and go under tribulation and have to come through it. Those of us who have the love of the Messiah in our hearts, we're going to be able to make it through the fire and be changed and refined and made spotless. But those who don't, it, it, we, we clearly see that he says right here, the wheat is gathered into the barn, but the chaff will burn up with unquenchable fire. Yeah, so what John's saying is this, this one who is coming will baptize with the Spirit of God or will give you instruction from God and will also judge severely. And those who do not make it will be burnt forever. So we finally see Mark. Uh, so he's, he's picking up uh, at this point of the story. 
Um, in the very beginning of Mark 1, 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach, the son of Elohim, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So again, it's the same story that, that Matthew is referring to, but this is now from, from Mark's point of view. And remember, he's writing about the servant. So a lot of his stuff, his words are going to be cut shorter. He uses um, less adjectives, and he's, he's talking about the servant, whereas Matthew's talking about the king. So it says in verse 4, it says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him or being baptized in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Ruach Kodesh, the Spirit. So it's pretty funny contrasting the two together because we see him calling the Pharisees and the Sadducees brood and vipers. You know, he's going into a lot more detail in Matthew where Mark is, is being a lot more kind of plain and straightforward with, with his text. And again, it just speaks to, as Zach said, Matthew goes out of his way to show the Torah-observant Hebrewness of our Messiah. Mark gives us more of a Greek Greek interpretation of everything. He doesn't talk about the chaff, the winnowing fork, and all that stuff. And as Zach said, bringing in the Pharisee and Sadducees. And most of Christianity follows the Mark gospel because he leaves a lot of that Hebraic thinking out of it. So when you hear this story in John 8... Ate uh, locusts and wore a camel skin belt and all that, and he'll baptize you with the one that's coming, he'll baptize you with the Spirit... Even if they say fire, you almost never hear that verse afterwards that he's going to throw the throw the, the chaff in the fire and all that. That's almost never read in church. They stop at that point or they read Mark's version. And, and that's the whole purpose of, of this series, of this teaching, is, is to really layer them. The four gospel writers are writing from such different perspectives because they're all coming from a different angle. They're all writing about a different aspect, and they're all seeing the Messiah through different eyes. And to me, that's what's really awesome is when it all starts to line up, we start to see, you know, different bits and pieces of, of what's going on as opposed to just picking and, and choosing from, from one gospel or another. So Luke actually picks up with the same story. So John is the only one who doesn't go into the details of, of the baptism of Yeshua. So it says, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being govern, governor over Judea, and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, Tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Ab Abilene. Thanks for letting me read this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it says, During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So again, Luke, writing about the son of man, is going through a lot of genealogy, a lot of timing, a lot of dates, showing what was going on at the at the very time because he's writing from from more of a man's perspective more of a a literal perspective uh, so he says and he went into all the region around jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance and the forgiveness of sins as it is written in the book of the words of isaiah the voice of the one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the lord make his path straight every valley shall be filled every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways, and all the flesh shall see the salvation, the Yeshua of God. Okay, key thing here, that's not the same Herod that we just learned died. Herod was like a family name or, or a title of royalty. The other thing is here, he says Ananias and Caiaphas were the high priests. There's only one high priest if you follow the Torah. But these people were so wrapped up in their own Talmudic thing and their own political battles that Caiaphas was a priest and Ananias was his father-in-law who had him appointed priest after he was priest, so he was still pulling the strings from behind. And this will come up later when Jesus goes on trial that there are two high priests. There's really supposed to only be one high priest. This just shows you how far they had swayed from the Word of God into their own traditions and into their own political squabbles. And so what's amazing to me is that because there wasn't one true high priest and these were corrupt Roman-appointed priests, is that John is preparing the way for the high priest. The priest of uh, the the king priest of Melek Zadik, he's now coming to show the true way and to show the way back into what is supposed to be the truth of the Torah. Uh, so Luke picks up in his story. He says, "He said therefore to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father." So again, he's going into a little bit more detail, much like Matthew, where Mark left them out. He says, For I tell you, Yahweh is able 
From these stones to raise up children for Abraham, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be Hamashiach or the Messiah, John answered them, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. And, and so what Luke does is he, he really is, is going into this detailed account where it, it seems like he is, you know, interviewing not, uh, soldiers and, and tax collectors and, and getting an idea of all that were coming uh, to repentance. It's just kind of pretty amazing when we're able to layer up all the Gospels and start to pick out all the different details and, and see things that we may have missed by just reading uh, one or two. Uh, so it's probably probably a good place to stop tonight. Uh, and, and next week we'll get into the baptism of Yeshua um, and, and the beginning of, of his 40 days of trial and fasting in the wilderness. 